May the Lord give you power because you're going to need it. Power is control. Control describes a management of your area. When we have control, we are managing our area or the objects within our area, either the area itself or the objects in the area. So in Second Chronicles, there is a passage and it starts with the prophecy of a man named Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. Jehoiada was a high priest. He had died some years before this moment. A king, his name was Joash. He was a descendant of King David. And he was raised by Jehoiada, the high priest. He was faithful in the presence of Jehoiada, the high priest. When Jehoiada died, Joash became unfaithful. And the basis of his unfaithfulness was his relationships. Good relationships strengthen your ability to do what God wants you to do. Bad relationships weaken your ability to do what God wants you to do. The king became closely connected with liars rebellious people lustful people drunkards selfish people they became his his closer friends the people with whom he would interact frequently the king then because of these high profile relationships began to disobey the laws of God. Breaking the laws of God causes or causes your world to attack you. Problems come as a result of breaking the laws of God. Either you did it or someone within your family line or your, your area did it. So problems come as a result of a breaking of God's laws. Again, either you or someone around you or someone from your genealogical past, your ancestry, may have made some decisions that you are now affected by. Jehoiada has died. Joash is now connected to disloyal, unfaithful, reckless people, they motivate him to reject God. He rejects God. And Jehoiada, the high priest who raised King Joash, the high priest who kept Joash, the king, accountable, Jehoiada, he, uh, Joash is now free he's choosing his own friends his friends are not good guys and he begins to disobey god so jehoiada's son zechariah is a prophet a prophet is somebody who hears from god somebody who hears the words of god let me see if i can fix this a little bit okay i'll work with that so jehoiada has a son who's a prophet Zechariah. Zechariah hears God's voice. Prophets, people of God, they hear the voice of God in differing measures, in different ways. So God speaks to people in different ways. His nature doesn't change just because his methods of communication changes. So God speaks to people in their thoughts. He speaks to people through their emotions. He speaks to people through the scriptures, which is the most consistent or stable way to hear God's voice. 
but he also speaks in visions and dreams, audible voices, through situations, through the preaching. So God communicates with man so as to ensure that man is successful in this life and in the life to come. Success essentially is when you have a strong, when you have, when you love God and God loves you because God loves you, but whether you love God or not is a different matter altogether. God loves man, but that's not man's problem. Man's problem is man's lack of love for God. So God loves us and so he provides for us. Most of us reject him, and so that's what causes the problems that we have. The problems that we have aren't a result of the lack of the love of God. It's our refusal to love him back. And so, Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, he's a prophet. He hears from God. He understands the way God works. He understands the way God works in man's life he knows god's nature and god's purpose and so joash the king with his new bad friends doing bad things he's in position to hear the prophet zechariah's rebuke zechariah confronts him apparently openly zechariah the prophet son of jehoiada the priest who raised king joash Zechariah the prophet rises up and says to King Joash, verse 20, 2 Chronicles 24, verse 20, he says, or it says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, where God began to motivate him. God began to urge him. He felt the urgency of God, which motivated him to say these words. So the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people. So he stood on some kind of post or something that would enable him to be visible and said to them, said to the king and his prince friends, he says, thus says God, or this is what God is saying. Why transgress you the commandments of the Lord? Why are you breaking God's commands that you cannot prosper? Why are you disobeying God to the extent that now you can't succeed in the life that he's given you to live? And then he makes this statement, because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. David told King Solomon that. He said, if you commit to God, and that's in, second, that's in First Chronicles 28, I think. When you hear that message, that message generally is not supposed to discourage you to the, to the extent of stubbornness. It's supposed to develop a sense of urgency that motivates you to commit your life to him. So David, David is, is leaving. He's about to die. He's about to die. And he tells his son Solomon... These words in verse 8 of First Chronicles 28. So, First Chronicles 28, verse 8, David says this to his son Solomon, who's going to reign after him. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. Aspire to know God's will for your life according to what he's told people who are were closer to him what his expectations are for people. The Spirit of God tells people what his expectations are. And he, God, decides how much to say to whom. So he says, I'm going to tell Moses what to say to these people, and the people are going to be held accountable for obeying what Moses says because it, the information doesn't come from Moses. He is just the messenger. He's describing how things work through this law. God communicates with Moses. Moses communicates with these people. The people obey and they see the miraculous benefit of their obedience. So Moses tells the people 
what God's expectations are, the people begin to obey God for those that began to obey God. And they begin to see God's favor, his protection, his blessing in their lives. So they recognized the information as from God. David tells his son Solomon, you need to obey the things that the Spirit of God said through the prophet Moses as written down in the Old Covenant in that law. It wasn't called the Old Covenant then because there was no New Covenant. And there was nothing to compare it to. So it was just called the Law of Moses or the Law. And so David says to his son, follow the law and aspire to know God more and more through prayer and the learning of the law and the, and the obeying of what God is saying when you pray to him and when you read his word. He says, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God that you may possess this good land so that you can control the blessings that God has given to you and leave it, uh, and leave it for an inheritance to your, children at, uh, to your children after you forever. So he's saying, obey God's law so that you can live in the land perpetually, indefinitely. God loves you and wants to bless you with all of this, so obey God's voice. Verse 9, he says this, though. And you, Solomon, my son, he calls him by name because he wants Solomon to understand the gravity, the seriousness with which he's about to charge him. He's about to charge Solomon, and he says this. And you, Solomon, my son, know you the God of your father. He's saying, the God that I serve, you need to submit to. You need to know him. You need to commit to knowing the God that I, your father, David, serve. Know you the God of your father and serve him with a perfect heart, absolute loyalty. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. That's what David says to his son Solomon. Serve God with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches or examines all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He understands all the reasonings and the justification for your decision making. We need not feel like our conversations with people and the conclusions that we come to in those conversations persuade God to change up anything that he does just because I can convince you that what I'm doing is okay doesn't mean that the laws of nature the laws of God change if what I am doing is contrary to God's will it doesn't matter how many people support applaud appreciate or believe me life is not going to work well for me because God is in control of things of existence and of how it works so David lets his son Solomon know that. Now this is a very important admonition because Solomon is the king and generally what that means is that there's nobody who's above him that can essentially hold him accountable for his decision making. So David tells Solomon, God is going to hold you accountable for the things that you do. And so he says to his son Solomon, Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all the hearts and understands all the imaginations of your thoughts. And then he says this to his son Solomon. If you seek him, if you go after him daily, if you desire to engage him daily, if you pursue him to interact with him, to receive him, to feel him, to understand him, to obey him, to make him visible through your behavior and through the results of your obedience to his voice. If you seek him, he will be found of you. God is findable. God is findable, feelable, accessible. You can find God. You can access God no matter who you are, no matter where you are. God is accessible to humankind, to mankind. So if you seek him, you can find him. He will be found of you. But he says this. If you forsake him, 
He will cast you off or reject and remove you for ever, indefinitely. So he talks about two indefinites. In verse 8, he says, obey God so that he can prosper you forever, indefinitely, world without end. If you reject God, he says he will reject you forever, indefinitely. You don't know. There, 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 there are no limits to what that rejection can look like. And then he ends, ends with this. Take heed now or pay attention and obey. For the Lord has chosen you, talking to Solomon, his son, to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong or be dedicated and do it. Don't let anything stop you from doing exactly what the Spirit of God wants you to do. So, a few decades or maybe even a few centuries later, now that I can think, maybe a century or so, later, now we have David's and Solomon's great-grandson, uh, Joash, who has befriended some ungodly people, and they influence him to behave as they were behaving, which is why it is so important to have healthy relationships, because relationships are designed to influence you. It doesn't make you weak because you are influenced by people. That's why you have to obey the Lord when the Lord tells you the kind of person you ought to be and the kind of people with whom you ought to interact. So, and you are going to attract people, various kinds of people, but particularly you're going to attract people according to the way you present or project yourself. So if you present yourself a certain way, you are going to attract people that are that way. It doesn't mean that you're going to attract people that are other ways. But if you are consistent in how you present yourself, then you are going to continuously develop or receive relationships, experience relationships, attract people that are sent from God to you to help you to strengthen you, to hold you accountable, to sharpen you, to support you so that there's a purpose that's fulfilled by God. When bad people or people that are working against the will of God for your life come into your life, if you are consistent in your pursuit, pursuit of God, you'll be able to identify the bad and make decisions accordingly. Like, okay, well, this person here after careful examination for X amount of time is against the will of God for my life. I might like them, but it, it's clear that their decision making is inconsistent with what the father tells me according to what he's told those who are stronger and more knowledgeable than me. Men who have already finished their journey and are with him in heaven right now waiting for Jesus to come back to the planet and to govern it because it's his. So, now Joash has bad friends. He's acting in a bad way. And Zechariah, the prophet, stands and says to him, the reason why you are experiencing the bad circumstances in your life, the reason why the nation that you govern is experiencing such hardship is because you, King Joash, you've rejected the laws of God that he gave to all of us Hebrews. You've rejected God's law, and now you can't succeed. You can't prosper. You can't accomplish the will of God, and poverty is the result of it. Violence is the result of it. Sickness is the result of it. Betrayal is the result of it. There are natural, disaster, natural, natural disasters are occurring. All of these things are occurring as a result of the disobedience of the king and those that govern with the king. You are at least responsible for setting a good example. You may not be expected of God to preach to prophesy, to lead in song, 
to teach the scriptures. You may not be in position to do any of those particular responsibilities. But your faithfulness to God should be emulated by those around you. You should live in a way that motivate people to follow Jesus. You should look like Jesus to the extent that when people see you, they see the standard by which they are called of God to live. If you do that, God's going to protect and prosper you in ways you cannot calculate or quantify. And so, Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, Jehoiada, the high priest who raised Joash, protected him from death and raised him. Zechariah is now public enemy, number one in this moment. Verse 22, or verse, 20, verse 21. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. They killed him in the temple of God where Jehoiada at some point governed. This did Joash the king, or in this, or thus, did Joash the, Joash the king remember not the kindness which, which Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had done to him. But killed his son. And when Zechariah died, he said, the Lord look on it and require it. It is critical for us to know the state of the nation in which we live. We need to know that we are in a post-Christian nation. Now, that's a very secular way of describing that. So let's transition to a directly biblical or spiritual. Let's transition to some spiritual lingo. Hardened. We are in, so the United States of America is in a Matthew 11 verse. Matthew 11 verse. Let's see. Jesus is talking to cities where many of his miracles were performed. And, and so Matthew 11 verses 21 through. 24. So Matthew 11 verses 21 through 24 describe the state of the nation in which you live. And that's not the only passage. Obviously, there are others. But the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Ghost and, th and the Holy Spirit, through people of God, sons and daughters that are in America and that have been in each generation, each generation of American society has seen men and women of God come and go. They serve their generation and then they die. From the beginning of the United States of America's work or function till now, there have been men and women of God on this soil speaking the word of God, exhibiting God's expectations for it. Many of the people in the United States obeyed the Lord at least to the extent that he, he's protected the nation. He's blessed the nation. The nation has developed financially, even allowing those who practiced high-level witchcraft to financially support the structure because the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. God uses bad people. Oftentimes, their, their skills, because he gave them those skills, to strengthen people. He, he does that. So, all are the servants of God. The good are, are God's servants eternally. The bad are God's servants temporarily. So, there are those who will serve God as his tools temporarily until they die and then they'll go to a bad place permanently. And then you have those who serve God in this life and they'll inherit the new eternal life that will be here, in, here on earth. So, Essentially, we are deciding which of those kinds of people we want to be. Do I want to be a, a servant 
an expirable servant or do I want to be a son of God? So Jesus is preaching to these cities and says to them in verse 20, Matthew 11, verses 20, 20 through 24. Then began he, Jesus, to upbraid or openly confront, openly publicly rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works, mighty healings, mighty miracles were done because they repented not. Their mentalities didn't change. Though they saw his goodness, they saw his work, their mindsets were the same which were the causes of their suffering. We do things as individuals and a society that cause us to suffer. And then out of God's mercy, the Lord will position someone to hear his voice and to harness his power to bring about peace, love, and healing in people's lives. As the Spirit of God does that, at this point we are now responsible for loving, seeking, and serving Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Because many do not respond that way, they become hardened. That means they become insensitive to his daily expectations, and they begin to act like he doesn't have expectations for them, and they begin to think that they are free to behave in fear and paranoia and lust and arrogance and conceit, selfishness and aggression. God does good things for people. Most of the people for whom God does these good things don't permanently change. They may temporarily show gratitude, but most don't permanently make any changes to their decision making. And at this point, they become less sensitive to the voice of God. That means they are less responsive to his expectations, no matter how clear he speaks, no matter how clearly he speaks to them. Through preaching, through reading the scriptures, they can read scriptures and the scriptures not affect their thinking at all. Yet they can read the scriptures often. They can go to church and it could even be a good church where the word of God is actually modeled and it not impact them. So America and many of the nations of the world who have already heard the message of Jesus Christ and who have seen the power of Jesus Christ, in most of these circumstances, it's not that they need more of the word in order to know God's will. It's that the Lord has allowed them to remain stuck in their conclusions that they're free to behave against God's will. Like, no, God loves me, and what I am doing is what I essentially have the right to do. And that's the decision that God seals many people in. We talk about the reprobate mind, a mind that is unchangeable in its state. It's stubborn. It is seared. Paul talks about it being seared as with a piece of metal, a hot iron. And, and, and when you sear something, you lock, you lock it in place. That means that the mind is unable to change. Many are in that state. They're in a state where their minds are unable to change. They can't see outside of how they see and if they do it's temporary and then they revert back to the old mentality that's what Jesus was confronting Jesus came to a hardened people many of whom were going to commit but most of whom would not yet he would do miracles for many the Lord blesses more people than will actually spend forever with him. So most of the people that will get good things from God won't spend eterni eternity with him. Many of the churches are structured that way. 
They're built to attract people to the goodness of God, but not to eternity. So most of our churches here in America are not designed in that they are not speaking or modeling the message and power of Jesus that enables people to pursue and to experience eternal life, eternal life. Most of our churches and religious organizations, Christian religious organizations, because we don't qual we don't count the Jehovah's Witnesses, we don't count the Roman Catholics, we don't count our uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Those are false systems. You say, how do you know, Brother David? Well, God gave us a Bible and understanding by his spirit of what it's saying. And the Jehovah's Witness, the Roman Catholics, the Orthodox Jews, the Muslims, the Seventh-day Adventists, those belief systems are contrary to the preaching and the behavior of Jesus and of his apostles. The, 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 the Mormon religion, the Mormon religion, uh, Hinduism, these world religions do not replicate the love and power or knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're just systems people apply to make themselves feel righteous, even though there's no evidence of Jesus active in their assemblies. There's no evidence of the power. There's no power. There's no control. It's just philosophical religious spiritualism without any result. Jesus teaches people and empowers them. He, he, he equips the church to represent him. Most of the churches and religious people in America are attempting to serve two masters. They're attempting to serve God and money and family and social status and pleasure and entertainment. So most are attempting to strike a balance between the word of God and their own cultural traditions, fam familial traditions. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying, they're working very hard to serve two masters. And the churches that they are attracted to are led by people who essentially are trying to meet their needs, their material needs, financial needs, family needs. You have ministries that target people's desire for family. Come be a part of our family. Welcome to our family. Yeah, the word of God says he sets the solitary in families. So many are pursuing God because essentially they want to be accepted by people. We all are designed to be accepted by people. The question is, what is first? So the Lord gives resources. He gives material. But, it, but that's not first. The Lord blesses with relationships. That's not first. The Lord blesses with status. The word of God says that. A man's gift will make room for him. Okay. So God does promote. God does elevate. God does enhance reputation. Reputation isn't God. Relationships aren't God. Resources aren't God. Accomplishments, which of course feeds into reputation. None of these things are God. So in the churches... Most of them. And you say, David, why are you, as a pastor, a preacher of the word of God, why are you attacking the churches? Jesus said that judgment must begin at the house of God. Most in America assume they are in favor with God. Not everybody is lying. Jesus said to the religious to the religious of his day, if I say I don't know him, then 
I'd be a liar like you. So it sounds like we're saying the same thing. David is saying he knows God and that this is God's will. Others are saying they know God and that this is God's will. It sounds like we're saying the same thing. But we're saying different things. Though we're saying the same things. So some are lying and some are not. Most are lying and some are not. So Jesus lets us know as early as Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are aggressive Vicious wolves. I remember having a dream where I was at church years ago. This was probably 2006 or something. And I dreamt I was at church and it was full of people. And I don't want to mix these dreams, but I was at church, it was full of people. And they were pastors on the platform and on the big desk pulpit podium the the desk was a it was a table it was that desk they preached from but it had plates of food on it and the pastors were eating they were eating food and I was seated in the, at the back of the church where the youth were. A lot of young adults were back there. And most of the church was full with people who were in support of what was happening at the church. With the exception of the youth that were scattered along the back of this congregation. And the pastors were sitting there over uh, overlooking the congregation. They were looking at the congregation as they were... They had their utensils and they were just watching the congregation intently and they were just eating food. They were eating that platform that they would preach from. They were just eating from as if it were a table they were eating from. And the scriptures talk about those that feed themselves and those that do not feed the people of God. They feed themselves. And so once the main pastor was done eating, he gets down from the platform, bypasses all of the members of this congregation that were there and gets to the back where these youth are and he begins to verbally chastise them. He begins to speak to them very harshly as though they were bad people. And these were the young people, not the ones who were financially contributing to the church. He bypassed all of these other people who were clearly insensitive to the will of God and he targeted the youth who were hungrier for the truth and vulnerable to this influence because the other people that were in front of these were older, more accepting of this condition of the church but they were also feeding into these guys lifestyles outside of this position this leadership position so they got up the guy gets up and he begins to confront these young people as though they're the problem or as though they are a problem that's what the Holy Ghost is saying right now the people who are in position to accept the truth are being viewed as the problem. But those who don't mind the entertainment and the vanity that they're getting when they go to these assemblies, they're the ones that are defended, accommodated, spoken well to, supported, embraced, Affirmed, yes, they're affirming the people with money, affirming the people with world status, affirming them, appeasing them, entertaining them, making them feel comfortable with this setting. But those that are just simply there 
to learn and to know the truth, those are the ones that are being rejected. And I, in that dream, as the main pastor got down and began to attack the young people, I began to get up. And there was a, a battle. And I began to fight with him. Not physically. I forget what, you said, what began to happen. But there was a spiritual war between he and me. So we began to go at it. And then I awoke. And I knew what the Holy Spirit was saying. And we can read that in the Bible. And that's the, f the weirdest, the funniest, not funny. That's the strangest thing about people's attitudes. Is that the sons of God in the, in the church, if you are not a part of the church. I just, wanted to, I just want you to know if you're watching this. If you're watching this and if you're, if you're not a a consistent member of the house of God. I want to say this and I hope you understand. And if you don't understand, then I'm talking to those of you who do understand. You don't have a voice. You have nothing to say about the church. Unless you are obedient to God and ensuring that you are in position to be in the house of God. You have zero say so concerning what happens in the church. I don't know how many friends you have, subscribers you have, support systems you have, how much knowledge you have. If your knowledge does not produce obedience, if you are not in the church of God, you have no right, no godly right. Now, you have Facebook right. You've got YouTube right. You've got Instagram right. You've got stupid friends that you have right. Yeah, you can speak to your ignorant friends. You are ignorant supporters and they'll support you because they're vain like you are. And they think that you have right to say stuff. But if you're not in the church, you don't have right to rebuke the church and talk about the problems in the church. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says, we judge those that are inside. The church judges the church because the church has spiritual authority from the Lord to, to confront what's happening in it. Guys who have been discouraged, made afraid, or who are embittered and operating in pride and just an inability to submit to the word of God, who are outside of the church and won't move to find one or won't start one. If you're on the outside, all you have is Google and the Internet. And ignorance to be awesome. Yeah. And I don't say that to be rude or disrespectful. I'm saying that you're already in rebellion. So you don't have a voice. You might think you have a voice. But disobedience silences you. Like, oh, judge not lest you be judged is for you. Deal with the fear, the pride, the rebellion in your own eye, meaning correct that, get to the house of God, start one or be in it, and then you can correct what's happening as a result of faithful submission to God's word. Other than that, God's going to take away your YouTube, Facebook, social media platform anyway. This is all going to evaporate in a few years anyway when things change. So we need to respect that. If you don't believe that, it's because you're deceived. You de you're deceived. You don't, you, you don't, you're, de you're deceived. So that's easy. Yeah. So you confront rebellion and fear and stubbornness in your own life. And then the Holy Ghost will establish you. To confront it in the church that you are a part of. So. We. We. The people of God. Hold the people of God. Hold the people of God. Or the professed people of God accountable. For adherence. To the word of God. We the people of God. Hold the people of God. And the rest of the world to whatever extent accountable. 
by living and preaching the truth. That yeah, absolutely. Like you from behind a phone or a computer don't get to hold the church accountable. Look at look at what the church is doing. Like what are you talking about? What church are you a part of? Are you a part of a healthy church? Are you starting a healthy church? What are you doing? So America is hardened. We have experienced the miracles. We've experienced the power. We've experienced the love of God. We've experienced waves of God's work here in the United States of America. But yet, our mentality of individualism and our love for entertainment has still kept us stagnant in that we can't do daily what God wants us to do. And so, he's cursed the nation. The Lord has cursed the nation. And many can't free themselves. They can't save themselves. The word of God says, Peter told the people, save yourself from this backward or untoward, this not forward moving generation. When he said save yourself, he meant rely on the power you sense from God to obey God because God is withdrawing power to obey from those who are taking too long to respond. He's taking power from the atmospheres as he's promised to do several times in the word. He's taking power to obey from the atmosphere, from the setting. When you watch things you're not supposed to, and when you listen to things you're not supposed to, and you watch people you're not supposed to, and you let people influence you, that weakens your desire to know who God is and, to, and your ability to obey his voice. And so as people have exhibited an appetite for ungodly things, as they've exhibited a passion for things that God has told them years ago to depart from, he is withdrawing more and more their sensitivity to his voice. Zechariah spoke a curse over those people. And he says to them, he says to them, because you've forsaken God, he's forsaken you. And what that essentially looks like actually is described later on in the passage. So they heard Zechariah, King Joash, commanded his servants to kill Zechariah, even though Zechariah's father raised Joash and made sure that he did not die. Joash was ungrateful and ordered the death of Zechariah. And so Zechariah, under that system, stated this. He says, the Lord look on it and require it. He spoke a curse over those people and he said to them, May God punish you, or may God treat you, may God do to you according to what you just did or are doing as they're stoning him. So they're attempting to stone, they're stoning him. And as he's dying, he says, Lord, judge them according to what they're doing. If they're doing the right thing, then there's nothing to worry about. If they're doing the wrong thing, then there is grave danger up ahead. So as Zechariah is dying, 
the prophet because they can't throw rocks at, up at God. So they throw rocks at the people of God. I can't find God to fight God. So I'll throw rocks at those who speak on his behalf. And so as he's dying, he says, may the Lord judge you. May the Lord look on what you're doing and hold you accountable for it. Verse 23 says, and it happened, it came to pass at the end of that year that they did this, that the host or the group, the, the, the uh, small groups of the Syrians came up against Joash, King Joash and the nation of Judah. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes, the leaders, the royal leaders of the people from among the people and sent all their riches all the spoil of them, all of the stuff they got, their rewards for doing this to the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, meaning the men of Judah were outnumbering the army of Syria. They, they, they outnumbered the Syrians. But because God was against the nation of Judah for their hatred, again, hatred for God, he allowed the Syrians with a small group of people to win battles against this much larger assembly of, of Judah. Why? Verse 24 says it. Because they had forsaken, forgotten, or rejected the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash, and then he died as it was, he, he died, or it says in verse 25, and when they were departed from him, when the Syrians left, for they left him in great diseases, so his wounds got infected, apparently, from these battles, his own servants, so when they left, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons, plural, so apparently, apparently, Joash killed more than just Zechariah, more than just Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, he killed others of Jehoiada's sons. His own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and killed him on his, own, on, on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchers, in the royal graves. So they lost their king and many of their leaders as a result of their rejection of God's word. America is in a preliminary state of judgment. Proof of that is that you can't hear the truth of God at most of our churches, nor can you see a good enough example in most of our assemblies, nor can you figure out who on social media, on television, is telling the truth because they say one thing with their mouths, but they do other things with their hands. So you don't really know who's who. Again, they'll speak about God and then advocate some wicked movie or cultural event and that's a precursor condition the inability to discern right from wrong at the highest level which is not the white house but the church house the condition of the church house is evidence of god's wrath on the nation you see these people can't tell the left hand from the right in the church. That's why the nation is as messed up as it is. Because the nation would not be as bad if there were healthier churches, if the percentage of faithful churches was healthier. But because the Spirit of God is displeased with the nation, he is taking from them good examples. And the people are only or mainly, primarily 
accepting religious leadership that don't exhibit the faith of Jesus. They don't look like Jesus. They don't talk like Jesus. And our desire for the truth has severely diminished. And so God is, God is locking us into a mindset. Oh, is that what you want to think? I'm going to lock you into that form of thinking. I'm going to lock you in to that mentality. I'm going to leave you with that thinking until you die. The Lord said to the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 1, says, why should I keep punishing you? You're going to still rebel more and more. They can't associate the consequences with the conduct. It's just, there's a blindness preventing the society from associating cause and effect. And that's, and blindness is a curse. If you don't want to experience suffering on an eternal level, you are going to have to commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Like what Peter said, save yourself, repent, commit your life to Jesus Christ. You got to find a healthy church. If that means you have to move to California, from California to wherever, if you've got to get to Wisconsin from Texas, if you've got to go from Texas to Alabama, if you've got to go from Alabama to Jersey to find a church, if that's what God has done, you got to do it because the people of God are the ones that are going to be protected from A... Hardness of mind and heart, and B, great measures of God's punishment on the nation because he has hardened and determined the destruction of the nation, which means widespread violence and poverty. He's promising that widespread violence in the nation and poverty just because it hasn't happened at that scale doesn't mean it won't happen. We don't have enough money, military might, or knowledge to prevent what the God of everything is going to do. Every powerful empire and nation falls. Their obedience to God determines how long they last as a people. How long he tolerates their function, their lawfulness, their submission to God's order. Even if they don't really know his name, there's a measure of mercy he can provide. America knows his name. America knows his name. And we misrepresent him internationally. And so he's judged us. He's locked us in. And so we have to prepare ourselves. The people of God who can hear and understand this truth, we have to prepare ourselves. Because everybody else, he's locking into a mentality that will prevent them from making any other decision than what they were making before they met him. This is your brother David Williams with Jesus Ministries. Jesus is coming. Prepare yourself.